tonight's meeting of the Envir Environmental and Natural Resources Commission. So we'll start with our roll call. Let me just pull up our, we have a more complete list. Uh, welcome to our new commissioners. I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you last month. I was not at, at the meeting last month. So Ben and Cameron, good to meet you. Um, so uh, roll call, Commissioner Bryan. I'm here. And then Commissioner Doser. Here. Commissioner Miller, not here this evening. Uh, Commissioner Paulzer here. Commissioner Redmond. Here. And then, um, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Ben, I'm blanking on your last name. <laughs> um, It's Gill. Gill? Yep. Okay, so Commissioner Gill. Is here, and then Commissioner Bailey. Oh, um, so Cameron Bailey is our guest speaker, but uh, Emma Broadnack oh. is our Emma, new Emma. I Emma. apologize. Yes, that's right. I was scanning names quickly, and, and I apologize that Cameron was the first one that I saw, and it seemed familiar because it was on the agenda, obviously. But uh, Commissioner Broadnack, then. Uh, Madam Chair, it looks like she just signed on, so maybe there she is. There she is. Excellent. Welcome. So we're just doing roll call. So it looks like we have all but Commissioner Miller here with us this evening. So then our next uh, agenda item is the approval of the agenda um, for tonight's meeting. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda for tonight's meeting? If there are none, then um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make the motion. All right, it's, a, it's been motioned by Commissioner Redmond to approve the agenda as submitted. Is there a second? I can second. Uh, com Commissioner Brodnack seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? All right, eyes all for that. And then uh, we do have approval of minutes. Um, it looks like due to um, lower attendance last time, the uh, the minutes from these, the, uh, let me scroll down a little bit here on my phone. I apologize. I'm, I'm scrolling on my phone to look at our uh, agenda for tonight. So I apologize for the delay on that. So um, we do need to approve the October 18th uh, minutes as well as the November 15th minutes. So let's take a look first at the October 18th meeting minutes. Were there any additions or corrections to those? All right, so uh, if there are no additions or, or corrections that need to be made to that, um, we're looking for a motion to approve the October 18th minutes as submitted. I'll motion? move to approve. Move, moved by Commissioner Bryan. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dozer. All in favor? Say aye. 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 And then, um, uh, Sean, maybe you can clarify for me, are, do we need abstentions for people who weren't at the October 18th meeting? I know we had new commissioners since then, but it's, I, I believe they'd be able to vote for those minutes, right? Uh, Madam Chair, I have heard that it, it's just approving the minutes, but of course, some of them weren't there, so maybe they wanted to abstain because they're not sure about the minutes. So <laughs> I don't think there's a, a standard, but... Okay, not a big deal then. Okay. All righty. Well, then uh, we can move along to the November 15th meeting minutes. Um, any additions that need to be made or corrections that need to be made to those? All right. If there are, are none, uh, let's move forward with a, a motion there to. Approve those minutes. I'll move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Redmond. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Bryan. So all in favor of approving the minutes from November 15th, 2021 meeting. Say aye. 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 And Madam Chair, uh, I, I just need want to abstain because I wasn't there. <laughs> oh. Thank so you. I think I saw but abstention oh, from. I was not there either. I should abstain too. <laughs> Okay, so two abstentions, eyes 
all for the or to the remaining. I'm sorry, Sean, you were going to say something. Oh, yes. Sorry just, for um, interrupting. Um, I'll just get clarification from the city attorney. Um, I, I had always assumed you would abstain if you hadn't been at the meeting, but I serve on another commission in my community and they just say approve them. So I don't know if it's a Robert's rules issue or not, but I'll get clarification. Okay. I'd like to do it right if there's a right way to do it, but yeah, if, the, if we don't need to go through that formal process, that's that's cool too. So, um, all right. So then, um, on our agenda, that takes us to the agenda item for the um, renewable energy ordinance and Soul Smart certification. If I haven't scrolled too far down, <laughs> <laughs> multitasking. I know I have three, I have three screens here. Which one to look at? Um, okay, I'm used to using multiple monitors, so the tiny phone screen is, is not super <laughs> helpful as far as that goes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. So tonight we're going to continue our discussion on the Renewable Energy Ordinance and Soul Smart certification. And to uh, kick start our discussion, we have uh, an esteemed guest with us tonight. Cameron Bailey. He is with the Metropolitan Council and he serves as the um, technical advisor, is that perhaps your term, uh, for the Soul Smart program. So Cameron, uh, I had asked to um, fill our Environmental Commission in on a couple things. Um, for your information, uh, Maplewood uh, started participating in the Soul Smart program as a 2018, and we have been since awarded the silver award for our efforts in making um, a more solar friendly community. So Cameron is here tonight to kind of give us an update on that Soul Smart program and go into uh, maybe some examples of solar projects and just kind of get us uh, energized to see what else we can do here in Maplewood to make it uh, a more solar friendly community. So. Welcome, Cameron. And if you do have a presentation, I, I have allowed you to share that. Thank you. For sure. Thanks, Sean. And uh, thank you, commissioners, for having me here this evening. Uh, is my audio good? Okay, great. Thank you. All righty. <clears throat> so I didn't put together a whole presentation for y'all tonight. Um, figured it might be actually easier to just walk you through my outline. Um, so first thing I think to start with is kind of the Soul Smart program itself. Um, and give a couple quick overview updates on what has been updated with the program. Um, I think we're just past five years now. The program has been running on a national level. Um, and within the last, I guess it was this year, um, they updated some of the criteria in the program uh, in response to a lot of the feedback from a lot of the communities across the country who have gotten designated in the program. I believe we're over 500 cities, counties, and MPOs across. Reporting the in progress. Um, so at a high level, the most significant changes to the program are really um, just how the criteria are laid out. So I heard from a lot of communities like, hey, this is kind of overwhelming. You have a lot of categories. Can y'all condense that a little bit? And the Soul Smart program said, sure, we'll do that. Uh, so things like construction codes, um, solar rights. So what are the statutory rights in your state for your rights to solar access and development and utility engagement? Those all got moved together um, under the larger banner of government operations. So that's kind of the, the largest difference you would notice looking at the program. Um, no changes to any of the mandatory requirements of designation in the program. Um, but the thing they did add was more um, best practices uh, communities can pursue uh, to get designated in the program. Um, I'm just gonna call it a couple of them real quick. Um, one is exempting or waiving certain fees for residential solar PV permit applications. And another really big area is uh, a lot of new credits related to larger scale solar and energy storage. 
uh, Cell Smart program really started to help bring down the costs of staff time and thus the cost of permitting uh, for residential solar PV systems. And over time, a lot of the communities that do get designated within the Soul Smart program, their response is like, yeah, that's cool, that's great, but we also wanna be supporting larger commercial, uh, maybe even utility scale, usually not applicable in a city, uh, but maybe, uh, but larger commercial scale solar PV development and different types, as well as energy storage. Um, so SoulSmart responded to that, worked with a lot of the partners that the program's really made out of um, and added new criteria to give more direction and thus supports to communities who want to enroll in the solar, the SoulSmart Solar Ready program. Um, so yeah, that's where you'll find most of the changes there. Um, and I think the next place to go from there is one of the tools, uh, SoulSmart and the National Renewable Energy Lab have rolled out to help communities um, and you know, like reducing, again, staff time, uh, increasing education and reducing permitting costs for solar PV development. And that's called the solar app tool. And this is where I will actually um, share my screen here. So let me make sure that opens. Oh, great, the link works, this is good. Okay, I can share my screen now. So share screen. I'm not playing a video, so don't need to do audio. I think that should do it. And of course, and I have way more things up on my screen. Uh, there we go. I'm zoomed in way too tightly because I'm getting older. All right, the solar app tool. Um, in short, it's a solar permitting platform to help like really help cities, communities who do permitting to streamline their permitting application process. Um, I found this graphic from the larger presentation to be, I think the best summary of what it is. Um, so tightening up on that. Can folk read those words or is that still too small? I can't hear anyone, so I'm gonna assume that's all right. Read those, Cameron. Cam? Looks great. Okay, cool. All righty. Um, so the way the tool is set up is it's a large national permitting platform that the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is one of the federal research facilities in the US, specifically for renewable energy and energy efficiency, they develop a lot of tools that get rolled out across the US and they typically make them freely available to the public. Um, and as a part of SoulSmart, they developed this platform to help ease and streamline that permitting process for communities. Um, so starting from left to right, the first thing you do is select how you wanna integrate the platform. They said it's a nationwide platform where you just input your specific electrical and building and zoning codes uh, into the platform. And then developers submit their applications. It's a click-through process. And then the platform, based on information you give it, uh, that are the applicable codes and ordinances, it responds with, cool, your application seems like it should be good to issue solar. Here's your documents and forms. And here's our checklist for what the inspector will be looking for when they ultimately come out and inspect the PV system. Um, so you can either do it as a part of that larger platform, which of course, with that, you get more of the support of being tied into the larger network so you don't have to make upgrades to the platform, um, or you can do it as a standalone system. Um, so you can just download the platform, make it available on uh, a webpage, and uh, staff in-house can handle that. Um, second part, that was what I was just touching on, which is you put in basically like, who are your permitting contacts for solar PV systems in the community? Uh, they use applicable, uh, oh, applicable something jurisdiction. It's your, we use RGU, right? Responsible governmental unit, they use AHJ. So city of Maplewood um, put in what are the wind and snow variables and allowed loads and spans and all that stuff. Uh, what model code years and what are your terms and conditions? So basically everything that's already in your PV permits, it's just putting it, um, uploading it into this platform. That next component, um, you can either have the system itself handle payment. So the way it's freely available to cities is developers 
um, have to submit for a $20, $25 administration fee. Um, for point of reference, the average PV system permitting, uh, average PV permit system cost in the Twin Cities Metro is around $300 in application. Uh, so a $25 fee is a, is a greatly reduced cost and expense. And for city staff, the idea is you as staff don't have to basically hands to paper walking through every permit application, but rather use staff time for applications that don't meet a standardized permitting pathway. Uh, so staff time's better used on things where you actually need human to human interaction to figure out if something's applicable or not. Um, and then that last part um, is really just, you know, upload it and let people know, you know, y'all have newsletters, you have communication pathways within your community. Um, of course, as part of the social smart network, uh, we want to promote any community that's using the platform because that lets other others know it actually works. Um, it doesn't just and doesn't just work for communities in California, but actually here in the Midwest. Um, so that's the the uh, tool at a snapshot. Uh, there's a couple of notes I wrote down for it, just because I figured these are questions that usually come up. Um, as I said, you can run it as part of the larger national system or run it independently. Contractors, if their plans change, right? Because plans change during projects, they can resubmit their plans up to three times before the system will charge them a fee because they have to keep reviewing those. Uh, as I said, it's a free, free platform. The developers cover the cost of the platform to run to serve all communities across the country. Um, or you can use a standalone account, in which case you can just charge fees directly um, through your platform. Fees don't go through them if it's a standalone. Uh, they have a, it's a platform I hadn't heard of before, but think of something like a, a Venmo, but like more official and secure. Uh, I don't know if that's like a square. Um, so that is, bah, there we go. That is the solar app tool. Um, again, to help reduce permitting costs. That's updates to the programs. And then the few other points I wanted to hit real quick are just kind of snapshots of um, what we're doing at the council, right? To help with solar PV development as it, the um, different types of development start to grow um, within the market. So for one of those, and you know, we're thinking of, we're, we're gearing up for policy development for the year 2050. So we're really trying to be thinking and living in the future while still grounded to the present. So what I just gave y'all is being grounded in reality right now. And what I'm sharing now is looking more so toward the future. And that's where we get these tools. Um, this tool we have called Surface with Purpose that we're developing at the council. Uh, what I'm showing you right now on the screen is the beta version of the tool that we pushed out earlier this year. And um, what this tool looks at is helps identify opportunities for solar and green roof development. Um, not just on buildings, but also as canopy systems over large surface parking lots. And so what we did for the metro, for every city in the metro, is we map building footprints, large surface parking lot footprints, and we're thinking large, rooftops over 2,000 square feet, and surface parking lots over 25,000 square feet. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's a quarter of an acre, something like that, uh, for larger, but, you know, we're thinking larger. And we're thinking of that because of our tools around uh, assessing localized flooding and urban heat island effect. Big drivers of those are large buildings and typically the large surface parking lots adjacent to them. So this tool is looking at, well, what can we do about that and how can we help communities across the metro um, have a more granular view of what we're talking about when we say large surface parking lots, large rooftops within any given community. So for the city of Maplewood, which I pulled down up here. I selected all buildings. We categorize this large lots and large rooftops by the primary land uses, which are, oh, decided to refresh on me. I think it's back. All right, and refresh pushes us up a little north to the little Canada. Let's get Maplewood back in here. There we go. I guess that's good proof that um, it's a live screen or web page. It's not some still shot I took. Um, so yeah, and we break try to break it out so there's some variability in it. 
um, in terms of land uses. So the main areas we find these large lots and rooftops are commercial, industrial, uh, multifamily, and office, um, institutional in there as well. Um, and then we you see at the well, in the map, you see like little green and red dots in there. We'll zoom in there in a second, but that's basically where those areas are. And then on the right, what we correspond that with is what's the potential for solar energy production. Uh, so what we're looking at right now with this little, I don't know what color, it's not red, peach, salmon, I don't know, strawberry, call it strawberry. So with strawberry here, uh, this is large surface rooftops and large surface parking lots that are in commercial um, areas, commercially zoned areas within the city of Maplewood. There's a potential for 255,000 kilowatt hours or 200 or 255 million, 255,000 megawatt hours of uh, energy production. And then we do that for the different land uses. And of course you can zoom in. So let's go up north towards the mall. And you start to be able to get pretty granular here pretty quickly um, in terms of seeing what's a, what's a lot, what's a building, how they aggregated. And the idea here is that, um, um, you all as you know, engaged public citizens in the city of Maplewood uh, have additional context for um, you know, some of the water quality and adjacent water bodies in the area or where localized flooding is occurring. Um, yeah, so without getting too into the tool, so be able to look at that and make, all right, so what does this actually tell us for this specific property? All right, at 1431 B Beam Avenue East, there's a Costco spot it's the big roof because costcos are huge what's the energy production potential from solar on that roof and then if it were a green roof what's the storm water retention or how much water could that green roof hold so if you know around that costco there's some localized flooding or the city's looking at expanding the storm water mains because they were built 60 years ago in that corridor um, it offers an opportunity to look at well are there different ways we could go about this does there maybe a a cheaper or a different stormwater best management practice in the form of green roofs that may yield multiple benefits beyond just bigger mains underground, which eventually are gonna become undersized as climate change continues to roll out. So that's what you see on the bottom right, which is a four inch, so a really shallow green roof or a six inch green roof um, for the depth. What's the difference in stormwater that could be contained there? And what we're working on, that was our beta version, what we're working on right now is a fuller rollout of the tool, uh, which gives a lot more context um, as well as actual case studies um, for what are it, what's anything remotely close to this look like in the metro right now. Um, so I'm giving you all the sneak peek preview right now, which won't be a sneak peek because these are recorded. Um, so, you know, just green roofs in the city, talking about why we're doing the tool, overlaying uh, those different little polygons that represent uh, large lots and rooftops with areas of higher uh, water pollution. Um, so a lot of DNR data overlaying that with solar resource potential maps. And then, you know, basically just framing up like what are solar panels, how they work, what are the pros and cons are the pros of them. Green roof, same thing. Oh, there's a lot more benefits to green roofs. Um, what's a biosolar system? It's saying like, why can't we, can we combine a green roof with solar panels? The answer is yes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, synergies that occur there. Green roofs keep solar panels cooler in the summer. We have most sun and get our most production out of our solar PV systems, as well as all the benefits that come with green roofs. And then, you know, just giving some case studies um, in terms of where you can find some green roofs, where you can find actually some quasi biosolar systems, over in Shakopee, Meadowak and Sioux. This is downtown St. Paul. Um, over in St. Paul campus uh, for the U, big surface parking lot canopy system here. Um, I think this might be Capital Region Watershed District's um, headquarters. Uh, but yeah, and then we're doing a big update to the tool. Not gonna get into that right now. There's, that's like a whole meeting. Um, so we'll drop that. And then to round out, the session, um, looking at a few things. So 
sorry, I got to move my screens where y'all are on my screen so I can see. Cool. Okay. So some of the different types of solar projects we're seeing in other communities in the metro. One, uh, I've been working on this for a few years, is solar on closed landfills, or you can think of that more broadly, solar on brownfields. So I don't know if anybody has land where there might be some like forever chemicals, from like a 3M operation, um, don't know what to do with that land. Um, bright fields may be a good option because solar on the ground is actually an intermittent use. Solar can be removed after 25, 30 years or whatever. So communities around the Metro have been saying, hey, we have these huge 200 acre or 20 acre closed landfills or big brownfield sites. Don't know anything to do with. We don't think we're gonna be the next TCAP site. Uh, we heard you could put solar on these. So cities of Eden Prairie, um, city of Ramsey and Hopkins are all um, pursuing that option right now. And I've, Eden Prairie and city of Ramsey are pretty actively involved in that because they have what seems to be a potentially clearer pathway to that sort of development. Hopkins has a much smaller um, site, I think it's about 12 acres. Um, but the cities of Egan and Hutchinson further out west already have solar and closed landfill developments with Egan's being on a, col a closed ash landfill. Uh, Blaine was pursuing that path a few years ago with an old demolition landfill and city of Hutchinson also has one. Um, as I kind of referenced in that previous array of pictures, uh, solar canopies on parking lots. So, um, you know, we get a lot of comprehensive plan amendments, which are usually supporting some sort of new development. And as well as we issue grants for our livable communities accounts for new developments or redevelopments. And so in the cities of Roseville, St. Louis Park, Minneapolis and St. Paul, we've seen uh, developer proposals come across, you know, the desks or of commissioners, planning commissions, and the council, uh, where solar canopies over surface parking lots are being proposed or actively planned for. Um, and I know I've, the use campus, Walter Mondale School Law. If you want to see a really cool solar canopy system there with EV chargers hooked up to it, um, kind of two things coming together in a really beautiful way, as well as a large pollinator restoration prairie right next to the school and rooftop solar and ground mount solar next door to it. Um, I kind of say the Mondale School Law site is a really cool place to go to to see uh, a lot of these stormwater as well as solar and uh, electric uh, electrification of uh, transportation um, kind of all coming together. A nice snapshot for where we are potentially uh, with those different technologies in one place. And then solar on new and old multifamily properties. So there's a program I administer called the Solar for Vouchers program, where we specifically try to help multifamily property owners who will lease to Section 8 voucher holders. And in exchange for that, um, we help them um, walk them through a solar procurement process to install solar on their properties. The idea being, hey, let's um, help bring down the operating costs with renewable energy for um, our business owners who are providing housing um, that's affordable. And so um, also that's just something you've been seeing happen across the Metro. It's kind of a, been kind of sneaky, but um, not sneaky, surprising how kind of rolling under the radar there, but cities of Egan, St. Louis Park, Roseville, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, Golden Valley, Mendota Heights, Minnetonka, uh, you can find larger and large, not actively like 200 unit buildings uh, with solar PV installed on them, new construction as well as old construction. Uh, so just something else to let y'all know or be aware of, there's just a lot more development proposals around solar um, coming up in these land uses. And then some of the challenges. I'm hoping, there we go, nice. Like should be able to fit on one page. So uh, first one here, I uh, went to a, a regular, I guess, sort of conference or meeting um, the county assessors have um, for our different regions of the state. They asked me to present and they were asking about how we should assess the value of solar in different applications. Um, you know, especially with the ordinance language here later, um, if we're looking at solar as a, an accessory use, um, how should we assess the value of a property itself if uh, an accessory to the main use was upgraded or changed or enhanced? And we've heard, I've heard from a lot of business owners, landowners, property owners is, yeah, uh, county assessors don't do it the same. 
uh, when they increase the value of the property after we install solar, that also increases potentially how much I have to pay in taxes. And sometimes I've heard some of them say like, I have to pay so much more in taxes now, it's kind of actually canceling out my cost savings from solar. Um, so it's kind of like, if you were to paint a house, you know, like red and it used to be beige, you know, should the value of the house go up um, or the assessed value of the land, I should say rather. Um, so it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, I wanted to put that on y'all's radar as something to be aware of. Um, granted, there's differences, right, between single family house or a duplex with solar on the rooftop. Uh, there's difference between that and, you know, 15 acres with a solar arrays, right, that, um, that that's a primary use that is being changed in that land, kind of like if you're going from ag to commercial or residential to commercial, there's a change in the value of that land um, for the value that's being produced there. Um, so that's one thing. Two, and this is something y'all are well on top of, uh, which is zoning code and ordinance language that is prohibitive or maybe delaying permitting or even development and thus increased costs because uh, any cost the city has to take on, um, you have to push that on to someone, right? Someone has to pay for it. Um, so that's really what the Soul Smart program is about is let's identify unnecessary barriers and remove those barriers through education and empowerment, um, and then provide tools and resources to help increase education and the translation of knowledge. Um, so not to say any and all solar is great, but rather what solar is actually safe um, actually works well and will last the intended lifetime of the system, um, as well as meet the business or residential needs of whoever decides to install it on their property. Now, this third one down, this is a growing one, which is transmission interconnection permitting with applicable electric utility. I'm pretty sure Maplewood's also primarily XL Energy. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Um, so as you know, XL Energy is the largest electric energy provider in the state of Minnesota, um, as a lot of solar has been coming online, as well as wind has been coming online, um, and we still have development unfolding. Uh, what I've heard from a lot of the solar development community is that permits from the electric utility to interconnect your PV system to the electrical grid um, have been slowing down. And that's from smaller residential systems up to larger community solar gardens. Um, so that's something in the city of North St. Paul, um, they're working with GPI to figure out how they can successfully advocate um, for around those issues of interconnection within the community. Uh, something I've heard from city of Minneapolis staff, um, as well as other communities in the Metro. Right now, in uh, most cities, it's kind of like rumblings, um, but in other places, it's a, it's a much more real barrier to uh, installing solar. So rather let you know that now, be aware of it now. So something you can ask now, Excel Energy has um, similar to us, like sector representatives for the service area. Um, so it could be a very good thing to ask your service provider or, or Excel Energy, ask community relations manager, hey, can we see a heat map for our um, transmission and distribution grid within the city of Maplewood. Um, it is publicly available as well. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know, pull that information, get that to y'all. So at the very least you're aware of where the transmission and distribution system is at within the city of Maplewood. And then running down the list, uh, I think, I would imagine at least for you, you probably heard a few of these. So, you know, still some of the regular questions such as, you know, how much is it gonna cost to replace my roof? Um, should I place it ahead of my maintenance schedule so I can put solar on it? How do I make those things match up? How does that impact my, my insurance policies? Um, who can I go to for help in those things? Um, so those are still regular questions. Um, answers are out there still, um, which is kind of why I'm still doing this job because it's still a really regular question. Um, another one, global supply chain delays, right? So the reason we're on Zoom right now, um, I'm sure solar is, I'm not sure. I know solar is not the only industry that's been impacted by slowdowns and production and, and logistics globally. Um, so it has introduced more variability into the pricing uh, within the solar industry, as well as in Minnesota. Um, something I still see fairly often across the metro is um, disagreement within communities on uh, how desirable it is to see solar or panels or not. 
Um, some communities are like, no, as long as they're installed well, if anything, we want people to see them because it signals to people within our community, we are a solar friendly community. We're a community that's actively trying to do something about climate change. Or at the very least, we actively support our residents um, increasing their, their resilience. Um, so happy to say in the five or so years I've been doing this, a lot more communities have removed um, some of those screening requirements for systems. Um, next one down, um, still this, you know, similar, same questions. There's a lot more solar developers in the space. And so um, I think it keeps that question well and alive, like, well, who's a good developer? How should I select a good developer? Uh, what's a good price or not? So again, that's why myself, I'm still in this role in the clean energy resource uh, nonprofit that provides energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency, technical assistance, uh, specifically that help with those sort of things. Getting down these last two things here, um, how to incentivize large industrial property owners within the community to adopt solar. Uh, so when I was meeting with city of Matamidi a couple of years ago when they were coming into the solar, the solar smart program, um, they were looking at their solar resource map that we generated for them. And they said, wow, we have great solar resource um, exposure on our um, FedEx distribution center. I was like, that's awesome. Like, yeah, that could probably meet close to a third of the, the entire residential energy electrical consumption for a whole year. Like, yeah, um, yeah we, we've had a little trouble actually getting in touch with them and reaching out to them. So I think if it's one thing to identify, like, wow, this is where we have huge solar reserves um, that we could be using to better power our community, cleaner power and a more resilient grid. Second thing, we don't know that own that land. How do we incentivize these businesses to you know, change some component of their business practice uh, to support their business as well as over well-being of the community? So that's still a very real thing uh, across the metro. And then last one here is recycling solar panels at the end of their life. So the MPCA, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, has been leading a pretty broad stakeholder engagement process for I think about two years now. Um, where they're asking these questions. Um, should we um, put a tax or a fee on the manufacturing side of the solar industry? Uh, so we build a fund over the next 30 years to start uh, putting money into proper handling and recycling of solar panels once they reach the end of their life, or rather there's just more efficient solar panels out there. So people start to trade them out. So what do we do with all these solar panels once they start getting swapped out? Um, or, you know, start crapping out. Um, so the state is working on that. Washington state is also working on that. State of California is also working on that, um, trying to be proactive in that space. So also letting you all, you all know that may be something that you hear about from residents or maybe have already. So if you do, give me a shout and I can connect you with Amanda Cotton over there. Um, or you can be proactive and ask me now and I'll connect you. Uh, she'd be more than happy to chat with y'all. And then last thing here, uh, solar panels still aren't free. Uh, as my mom would say, nothing's free, actually. Uh, so a few grant funding opportunities for implementing solar in the community. First one is, so reference certs or the clean energy resource teams. They do small seed grants, which are usually around 2,500 to $5,000. I think sometimes maybe they go up to 10, uh, but they're really small grants. They're really meant to help with planning, um, a solar ener energy efficiency process or project. They're available to I believe any sector. So that could be the city, that could be residents, that could be businesses within a community, religious institutions, school districts, whatever. Um, and they issue those on an ongoing annual basis. So we just got done reviewing those I think two months ago. Um, so great time to let you know. So you, you kind of got eight months to plan around for it if that's something you want to follow. Of course, there's Excel Energy's Renewable Development Account, which used to be the Renewable Development Fund, which is funded by fees. The state legislature levied on the Monticello, Monticello, or I don't know how to say it here. Uh, there's that one. What's the, the other nuclear facility in the state? The Prairie Island? Yeah, I believe it's specifically Prairie Island. Fees come from that to fund this 
renewable development account every year from the waste from that facility. And so that's money that has gone to a lot of like really innovative, really ahead of the line looking renewable energy development projects. So that Brightfield project in the city of Hutchinson actually got funding uh, through this fund. I think that was close to 10 years ago now. PACE financing, property assessed clean energy financing, the St. Paul Port Authority administers it, but they administer it across the state. Um, and CERTS uh, actually has staff who work with their program um, to help uh, execute that funding mechanism. Um, so education, uh, it's nice because really low interest rates, it's uh, tied uh, kind of as a levy uh, on the property taxes for the property. So you usually get at least a year with your PV system installed before you have to make your first payment. Um, which you know helps you accrue the savings to actually be able to pay for the, the cost of the system. And legislature changed this a couple of years ago. You can use PACE financing on existing or new construction properties. So a part of uh, building out or putting together that, that capital stack to fund a new development, you can incorporate PACE financing into that to help pay for some of those energy efficiency and renewable energy um, components of a project before it's even built. Um, which is really the best time to do these sorts of things. Um, one that's coming up, U.S. Department of Energy, American Made Solar Prize Round 5, <clears throat> which is really looking for communities and enterprises uh, across the U.S. Um, that are really trying to prioritize um, jobs creation um, to specifically support the solar industry um, around manufacturing or assembling within the U.S., uh, so trying to bring resilience to the solar um, manufacturing industry itself. Um, and a lot of different entities are taking a unique approach to that. Uh, XL Energy Solar Production Tariff. So pretty much anyone who installs a moderate sized PV system on their property is gonna use that tariff. Um, I believe funding ran out this year uh, before the end of the year. So um, it's <laughs> usually tell people, it was like, if you wanna go for solar, like, uh, yeah, get in on there early to lock that in because that's guaranteed over, a, I don't want to misspeak, I want to say it's a five or eight year, uh, first five or eight years of your PV system. So it really helps cash flow it because they pay you money for your production of solar energy to help with the uh, the financing for it. And last one here, McKnight and Bush Foundations um, um, issue funding pretty regularly, usually in the form of grants um, to different um, solar renewable energy initiatives, um, especially ones that are explicit about desire to have a positive impact on climate change, um, on racial and economic disparities, as well as um, increasing the health of the natural environment. Um, so I kind of say they're great for your like huge pie in the sky ideas. I was like, yeah, but like who has $5 million? Like Bush and McKnight got $5 million. Um, so that's, uh, I think I would I'd round those out going through those. Um, I guess pausing for questions. Pausing, stopping for questions. There we go. I don't have anything else. Thank you for sharing all that information. Definitely some new things that I, I didn't know. Um, have heard of Soul Smart over the years, but really good to to get the the big picture of all of the resources that that you have to offer, who you're working with, who you're partnering with. That's excellent to to hear about that. We appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, any any questions that we've got? Just kind of um, thinking, and and Sean, you can you can correct me if I'm I'm wrong about this, but. You know, part of uh, the reason for for speaking with Cameron and, and Soul Smart is our ordinance that we're that we're working on. So maybe a transition question, knowing that this was tied in with this agenda item, um, is to ask Cameron uh, thoughts in regards to the draft ordinance that we have that we're looking at um, tonight. I, were you involved with review with reviewing that? Oh me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Sean's, uh, you're great about that, Sean. Like, hey, <laughs> working on something, what do you think? Um, so yeah, uh, I think we did maybe two or three back and forth passes with that uh, in this current iteration. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I I'm really proud of the ordinance. I think it reads really well. Um, I think it's smart and being inclusive of and not being exclusionary in terms of what type of solar could um, what segment of the solar market could ultimately develop in the city of Maplewood. So I, I see really good ordinance language there for residential rooftop solar, for commercial rooftop solar, for ground mount solar, really small for like a residential property, a medium sized commercial property, something larger approaching something like a community solar garden, uh, which you, usually requires a few acres to actually do something like that. Um, uh, language around, um, I think vegetation was something we talked about for like specifically for like larger um, solar PV systems. Minnesota leads the, the country in terms of so many uh, of our larger solar PV systems being installed with native pollinators and native grasses uh, for the environmental benefits there um, with wildlife and habitat. Um, screening requirements I thought were great on there in that they're not present in any sort of like restrictive way, which I think is wonderful. Um, what else we have on there? Permitting is clear. Um, yeah, you're clear about your setbacks um, from boundaries or um, uh, lot boundaries. Um, shoot. Yeah, I mean, when I read through it, I was just like really excited. <laughs> uh, I just had a couple small comments back to Sean. Uh, this is great for me because uh, this is a lot big component of my job. So I meet with other communities nearby or on the other side of the metro. And they're like, hey, what's a good ordinance? How should we approach this? And it's one thing for me to say, well, the best practice says um, you should allow PV systems in these different spaces. Like, yeah, OK, that's a national best practice. Like, what are people actually doing in Minnesota, actually in the metro? Like, who else is actually following these best practices? So. Um, this ordinance, as I read it and as drafted, would be the ordinance that I would point to for other uh, first and second ring suburb, suburban communities across the metro. Uh, I think it's also great timing in the update to Soul Smart and Sean, you and Maplewood re engaging with Soul Smart to kind of push yourselves to that next level. Um, because, yeah, we're getting back on that horse next year. Um, and reconnecting with everyone like, oh, great. We, we're at a critical mass where about half the communities in the Metro now have a solar ordinance on their books or some sort of solar ordinance language. Like when I started, it was maybe 10% of Metro communities five years ago. And we're about 50 now. Um, and if we're excluding farming communities, it's a higher percentage than that. Um, so the ordinance as y'all drafted is definitely saying, all right, cool. We have a good baseline foundation. How do we improve upon that? Um, identify barriers we weren't aware of two, three, five years ago. Um, and how do we craft language to remove those barriers that we're now aware of? Madam Chair. Um, yes. Thanks to Cameron and the SoulSmart team for their review of our ordinance. So the city of Maplewood adopted the Renewable Energy Ordinance in 2011 and then in 2017-18, we, we of course became part of the SoulSmart program and they reviewed the ordinance uh, as part of that and offered some guidance on uh, changes that we should make. Uh, the Environmental Commission spent you know, a couple months on that and we, we modified it. But as I had stated previously, it never made it to the city council. So I doubled back and uh, checked with uh, Cameron and the team, and they suggested a few more changes. Uh, one in particular uh, dealing with the ground mount and uh, adding solar canopies. Uh, so we added that to the ordinance. Um, and we'll touch on those changes because we are looking for a motion of approval here um, after Cameron's uh, visit with us. Uh, but I had a question or two for our speaker. I'll just go ahead. Um, I was wondering, uh, Cameron, if um, the city of Maplewood could help on any kind of outreach for the solar program or multifamily that you work that you work on. Like, is there any way that we can communicate with our multifamily properties that this is a possibility? Yeah, that's a great question, and thank you for asking it, Sean. Um, for the implication, which is, y'all want to help. Um, 
so where we're at right now, we're just wrapping up the pilot this month, probably a little bit into next month. And where we're at right now is exploring how to expand the program to serve the entire Metro at the very least. Uh, so part of that effort is reaching out to other cities, um, mostly cities and housing authorities to ask, is this a program that sounds good to you? Is this a program that you want available in your community? Um, to basically you know, build up that, that picture of how much support and demand there is for the program. One, um, because that helps us define the program for how we're going to expand it, as well as bring in additional resources to support the program. Because right now we're running it with no additional money and we had landlords who wanted to participate what you usually find is most people just aren't aware of the existing resources. Um, but in other cases, um, it definitely would have helped some of these projects that had to drop out if there was actually any form of additional funding. So I don't look to cities for additional funding. I look to the state enterprise foundations um, for additional funding. But usually to get that, need some sort of broad support. Um, so that sort of explicit support from City of Maplewood, this is a program we like, it's a program we want to see in Maplewood, it's a program we see as value adding to our citizens, residents, businesses. That would be absolutely all I would ask for, I think. <laughs> so, um, do you want me to write a letter? <laughs> That'd be awesome. No. How are you looking for that support? Do you want to do a pilot project here? How do you want to handle this? Oh, right now, I just want to finish this pilot. Uh, wow. it's, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's always building building the plane while it's flying. So we're meeting with uh, potential partners to expand the program right now who already kind of work doing larger group procurement projects. Uh, they're like cohort based. So we're exploring that with them right now so we can get to the point we have enough additional support that we actually can run it um, uh, at the metro level. Um, and yeah, right now, like we're still kind of doing the one on ones with different housing authorities and um, cities. But I think for Maplewood, if that's something y'all would want to see ran in Maplewood um, for timing, we usually kick off the program for outreach and recruitment in the fall. So that way we can do the RFQ process with developers in the winter when they have a little downtime. Um, and then we can do site visits when we get into summer. So that would be the timeline. Um, Cause yeah, I, I mean, I saw y'all's Re resilient communities project proposals and just got really excited for that. Um, and I think the potential alignment there with um, solar and multifamily and affordable housing focus would be awesome. Um, definitely something there. Um, yeah, I think at the very least, like, yeah, that'd be super cool to, extend the Maplewood. Um, but yeah, that, that's our goal right now is enough communities like your reaction just now, Sean, is saying we've had from about 10 other communities in the Metro and a number of ones outside of the Metro. Um, so what you just said is perfect for me um, to help basically yeah, keep building that support. Um, not sure if we'll be ready by next fall uh, to push the program out again, um, but that's the hope. You know, so spending the summer, spring, the winter and spring, trying to build out that support. Um, and then hopefully in the summer, actually structure the program up. And then by fall next year, starting that recruitment uh, for enrollment. Um, so would uh, definitely hope we could include City of Maplewood in that. Thank you. Did you say, Sean, that you had a second question or that was? Oh, uh, I didn't want to. The, the one that you had. The time of, but I'll just go ahead. Because <laughs> I like all this. Um, I was wondering about this XL Energy heat map. Is that a map showing that they can't take any more connections? Uh, not necessarily. It's kind of like more so like a point of reference um, to get a sense of on you know, the whatever end of or segment of the distribution system you're looking at um is it and it's you know it's color coordinated so if it's redder 
Uh, it's kind of closer to capacity. It may need upgrades for any additional interconnections, whether it be new businesses or PV coming onto the grid. And same thing with the larger transmission line systems. So that's something I think they push that out annually. Um, but it's, yes, yeah, it's still a point of reference. Still ultimately to like really know it's like, well, you got to have a specific project in mind and you have to submit that. Uh, it's not a cheap exercise, especially start getting into the, the more expensive systems because they require a more vigorous review of, um, of that potential systems impact to the grid. Um, the, I think we're coming up on the new one being published in the next few months here. I usually think of it as a winner um, publication that gets pushed out. Um, so I can definitely check on that. I just tried to pull up the one I'd been looking at most this year and it says it's not there anymore. So I think it got put pulled down. Hosting capacity map. Oh, there we go. I got it updated. So I can drop that link in the chat if that's helpful. Um, but yeah, it's a good point of reference to be like, oh, the distribution line is a little hot right here. Um, maybe we should be proactive and get in touch with Excel Energy, whoever our community representative is or liaison is, um, and ask them about what we can do about that, especially if you have any specific plans as a community for that area. Yeah, I didn't know that existed, so that'd be helpful. Um, thanks for dropping that in the chat box. Sure. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time, Cameron. I'll just uh, pause for other questions. Yeah, my pleasure. Commissioners, any other questions for Cameron? Mm. All right. Well, thank you again so much for your time. All the information, I think there's a lot for us to go back and review as well. So you, you, you've given us a lot of great content that uh, you maybe take and, and move forward and partner with on some things. So thank you so much for that. Beautiful. And uh, as Sean said, so our goals here, um, you know, as far as this agenda item, were to review and discuss the opportunities to advance solar in our community. So we've touched on some ideas there. Um, talked about how some were incorporated into the ordinance and then the second thing that we need to do is hopefully uh, make a motion to recommend uh, approval or advance the renewable energy ordinance on to council so um, we should probably take a look at the draft ordinance that was in our our packets um, to see that so the changes were in red um, that were were made for this and um, just from from memory I apologize for not going back to prior months to double check everything, but from memory, it looked like the items that were discussed, you know, I missed the November meeting. So um, probably, uh, you know, a few other items were uh, tinkered with and, and honed in a little bit further. When I uh, reviewed the ordinance in the packet, I thought that it looked pretty good. I didn't have any uh, changes um, that that were obvious to me to make or any corrections that I, or errors that I saw. So, um, I want to open up the floor for conversations on that to see if any other commissioners had uh, had any items or, or Sean, if you have any comments to share about that, um, but hopefully we can make, move towards making a motion there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I will give just a brief update. And uh, first, I just wanted to thank uh, Cameron Bailey for his time tonight. And uh, Cameron, you have a, a happy holiday and um, feel free to sign off. We're just going to wrap up our ordinance and continue with our meeting. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Bye. So Madam Chair, um, I will just uh, briefly touch on the changes that we have seen here um, since our meeting in November. So um, again, uh, the changes really have to do with ground mounted solar and community, which are community solar gardens, a freestanding solar panel um, or these solar canopies that we had added uh, some regulations around. So the changes in the ordinance, you'll see starting on page nine under the districts. So this is in the solar section of the renewable energy ordinance. And uh, we talk about the ground uh, and solar canopies being permitted with certain placement restrictions. So the community solar um, 
that are under one acre. So those would be permitted as an accessory uh, use. Oh, I'm sorry, um, my notes. You know what, I gotta go to this third screen here. Mm -hmm. So many screens. I thought I took good notes, but I'll just go on the uh, ordinance itself here. So again, starting on page nine and I guess then moving on um, for the districts, basically allowing ground roof or building mounted solar as a permitted use in all zones. So all you need is a, build, a permit to add that solar. And then solar canopies, um, allowing as a permitted use in all zoning districts. So you wanted to put uh, a solar canopy over your uh, driveway in your residential uh, home. Um, there might be some uh, placement requirements, um, but it's still a permitted use. Or if you wanted to do it in a commercial setting, um, like at the Maplewood Mall, it's a permitted use, but there might be some setback requirements and so forth. And then finally, community solar gardens, um, the roof or building mounted community solar permitted, uh, ground mounted, that is one acre in size and under, that would be permitted as an accessory use in all zoning districts, um, greater than one acre in size, permitted as an accessory use um, in all zoning districts with a conditional use permit. Um, and then also uh, if it's a primary use. So if you're seeing a large tract of land like 11 acres or so, and they wanted to put all solar within there, that'd be a conditional use permit. And the intent there is that, you know, these larger scale uh, community gardens, um, they, they do have some impacts, you know, on the surrounding properties. Uh, so we want to have some uh, review and uh, maybe some conditions on those. So moving on to the height uh, on page 10, um, here's where we took a look at the solar canopies and um, I really had to kind of think about this, uh, but the residential, I thought, well, what would be fair there? I guess we wanna uh, restrict it to the, the uh, height of an accessory building which in residential, uh, you can have an attached or detached garage or shed up to 16 feet in height, and that's measured to the mean of the roof line. But you can have a building, uh, a home that's up to 35 feet. So I thought it's fair to, to allow that uh, residential uh, ground mount to be the same as that accessory, which we likely wouldn't see, but I guess if it's a solar canopy, you might. Um, and then you probably really would want it a little bit higher to be able to capture the sun. Otherwise, you know, if it's close to the primary building, it'd be maybe not as efficient to not as much exposure time. So I think that height makes sense to not limit that. And then commercial, um, uh, restricting it to the height of the primary building, which, uh, in um, Maplewood, most of our commercial um, is quite, you can go quite high. So uh, it's not very restrictive there. Um, and then the location, adding some kind of setback requirements for the solar canopies. So again, um, uh, requiring the setbacks of an accessory building for the solar canopy, because um, you know we don't necessarily want those uh, right up to the front of the, this would, this would require that it be set back, you know, the same as the house uh, for a solar canopy or whatever a garage would be. Um, and then the commercial um, having the same setbacks as the commercial district. And then ground mounted solar, but not the solar canopies um, requiring the setbacks of an accessory building, um, which in the backyard, you know, can be at the five feet from the residential property line in the front it's a little more restrictive and then commercial uh, having the same setbacks as commercial and then finally um, this last uh, round of discussion with Cameron is um, 
he had suggested that we add under the uh, ground mount uh, for solar over you know one acre that we require um, installation and establishment of ground cover meeting the beneficial habitat standard. And I included a definition of that, which is outlined in Minnesota statute and basically is uh, you know native prairie plantings, or pollinator plantings. And we can review that um, during the conditional use permit process, require that they submit that, that plan uh, for review. And then uh, they have to maintain that dur during the duration of the operation. So that is a summary of the changes that we have seen since last month to, the, to this month. And last month, you felt quite comfortable with our discussion, but we wanted to bring it forward to ensure that we had all commissioners involved and uh, we could make this um, overall recommendation of the ordinance. Um, so with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, commissioners, any questions, uh, points for discussion that you'd like to bring up? Doesn't, doesn't sound like it. Um, does that indicate that we're, we're ready, we're feeling good about it, ready to mm. make a motion to move this forward? Mm -hmm. So is there someone who'd like to make that motion? I'll make motion. All right, it's been motioned by Commissioner Broadneck. Is there a second? I'll second. Commissioner Brian has seconded. Um, so all in favor of uh, the motion to move this uh, renewable energy ordinance to forward to council for a review, say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? No opposed, no abstentions. All right, so eyes all for that motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I promise to bring this forward uh, early next year for review and approval by our city council. So thank you very much. Thank you. Glad we worked on this again and we'll get that official. Awesome. Uh, so that brings us to agenda. I, the next agenda item, the climate emergency resolution. So um, Sean, I believe you have a, a staff, an intro to this staff update on this. Thank you, member, uh, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Local governments of all sizes and in all regions of Minnesota will join in declaring a climate emergency on January 24th or 25th of next year calling for immediate action at all levels of government to address the climate crisis. And I did uh, bring this resolution of support for this climate emergency, um, just kind of as a staff briefing uh, during your November meeting. And I heard support for that. So modified the resolution to make it more Maplewood specific. But generally speaking, um, the Climate Emergency Declaration started in the United States by the Climate Mobilization Organization, and it calls for a mobilization of government and society to make significant progress on climate change by 2030. There are 2,000 jurisdictions in 34 countries that have declared a climate emergency, including three leaders in the city, or excuse me, in Minnesota currently, Crystal Bay Township, Minneapolis, and Duluth. And then now there is a group of 15 to 25 additional Minnesota jurisdictions that are actively considering participating in the climate emergency, including Maplewood. So uh, with that, I included uh, the climate emergency declarations uh, that were outlined by the group of cities that are reviewing it currently. And then the draft resolution, which um, the name has been changed uh, to a resolution joining cities and counties across Minnesota, declaring a climate emergency and asking the state and federal governments to help address it and provide valuable resources. 
And in this resolution, uh, we outline some of the city of Maywood's energy and climate goals that we're currently uh, have adopted, uh, just to show that you know we are supporting um, uh, moving towards our climate action planning. And um, I guess with that, I will stand for questions. And if the um, Environmental Commission does approve of this, um, I would bring it to or recommend approval. I would bring it to our city council uh, on the first meeting of the year, which is, I believe, January 10th. And then uh, we can forward that on to the group uh, for inclusion on that uh, announcement date of January 24th or 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, an initial question that I have, I believe it says January 24th or 25th. How how do we determine which which day it is? Do we approve it for one or the other? Or why is there the two dates on that? I must have missed that meeting, but maybe that's uh, the, the dates that um, uh, they'll present to the legislature. You know, and there's some oh. variation in committee dates or something. But okay. yeah, it has to do with the legislative schedule. Okay. Commissioners, uh, any thoughts on this? Comments or questions? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, I'm, I love it. I'm just uh, carefully reviewing to see if I have any tweakies, but I, I don't think that I do. I, I love the whole concept, so I'm supportive. Tweakies is a fun way to say edits or corrections. I like it. <laughs> well, we'll give you a little bit more time to, to review it, um, but I believe what we need to do then is a uh, motion to recommend approval of the climate emergency resolution. Well, being that I have decided that I don't have any tweakies, I would like to move uh, a motion of uh, uh, support and furthering it to city council. And I'll second right, the motion. All right, motion by Commissioner Redmond, seconded by Commissioner Dozer. Um, so all in favor of uh, approving the resolution and moving it forward to council, say aye. 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 All right, looks like eyes all. I don't believe we have any nays or abstentions. So eyes all for that. Excellent. Thank you. And I thanks, Sean, for putting that together. Time. Nicely done. Yeah, thank you. I believe, let me just scroll up uh, to our very top for the agenda. So that was um, agenda item number six. We did not have anything for seven or eight, which were visitor presentations and commissioner presentations. Um, so then we do have a few items, two items under staff presentations. For, so oral reports for those. I'm going to hand it over to Sean for those. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to remind the commission that our January and February meeting dates had to be rescheduled due to holidays that fall on those dates in that month. So the January meeting is January 25th. I don't have my calendar, but I think both of these are Tuesdays. Tuesday, January 25th, and Tuesday, February 22nd. Okay, thank you for confirming those are both Tuesdays. And the meeting will be at 7 p.m. And we have not heard, uh, but likely they'll continue to be uh, via Zoom for a while. And I then, wish that uh, wasn't the case, but it looks like it will be, unfortunately. And then moving on, um, in the past, uh, the commission has asked uh, for a reminder that during the next meeting, uh, we will be um, undertaking the elections for the chair and vice chair. And just to kind of give you an opportunity to think about uh, who you wish to appoint or if someone else is interested in serving. Um, currently the chair is Ann Paulser and the vice chair is Kayla Dozer. So we'll hold those um, elections next year. And uh, um, of course, chair runs the meeting and uh, is asked uh, on occasion to attend a council meeting to present some items. Um, 
and vice chair as, as backup. Uh, so but those are the general responsibilities, but um, consider that uh, for next year. And that is all I have for staff presentations. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, along those lines, um, it's always nice to have that reminder so we don't join the meeting and then all of a sudden have have elections because people I think like to think through you know what they'd be comfortable uh, with doing. Um, oftentimes we've had uh, the vice chair move uh, you know after they've been the vice chair for a year move to the chair role um, but that's not 100% of the time that that happens anything goes so um, and I you know just kind of maybe put some thought before next meetings next meeting if you know what your comfort level is with, with any of those so excellent well with that that brings us to adjournment um is there a or any anything further that we missed i guess i should uh, ask before we add that route all good excellent and commissioner broadnax and commissioner gill very good to meet you i apologize i didn't uh wasn't at the meeting last month a month for your first uh commission meeting but we're glad to have you um Look forward to meeting you in person eventually as well. So uh, glad that you're here. Um, and with that, is, is there a motion for adjournment? I motion to adjourn. Motion to motion made by Commissioner I'll Bryan. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Redman. All in favor? Uh, say aye. 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 All right. Looks like we're all good as far as that goes. So it is 8:19, and we're adjourning tonight's meeting. <laughs>